on Christology. We're studying who Jesus is. So I appreciate uh, always getting to look at, look at and talk about, but more importantly, um, talk with the person of Jesus. <clears throat> Uh, it's an interesting factor that in the uh, Garden of Eden, uh, when the first sin took place, it took place in the midst of a theological discussion about God. The devil came along, Eve is there, and the devil says, uh, hey, let's talk about God. What did God have to say? And they talked about God, and that's where sin was born, in people sitting around talking about him. And what should have happened is Eve should have gotten up and said, Wait, hang tight, don't go away. Run off to the devil, come on, in, or run off to, to God and said, come on in here. Get involved in this discussion. And if God had been involved in the discussion, so we never want to have a theological discussion without his presence. Yeah. So let's pray together. Lord, uh, do uh, come. Not that you have to, you're already here. For we brought you with us, for you live within us. And be in every thought, uh, expand our thinking, uh, help us to grasp and understand, um, maybe in ways we never had before, all that you are about. And most of all, Jesus, would you let us, uh, and I don't know if we can't comprehend and we can't get it all, but would you let us somehow feel and know and sense and experience the depth of the overwhelming depth of your love that drove you, uh, the motive that brought all of this about. And even though we can't comprehend it, could we experience it and know, it tru know its truth? Uh, to that end, we commit these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are interested in discussion, so feel free. Uh, and we're going to go back to uh, what we were doing last week and actually the week before. But last week we started looking at some of the basic passages in the scriptures that talk about uh, this fundamental concept about who Jesus is as he became a man. And uh, I can't, again, emphasize, oh, emphasize the strength of the importance of this concept. Uh, this is a lynch, what we call a linchpin concept. A uh, linchpin in a court case is the, uh, is the piece of evidence that if it's gone, the whole case falls apart. This is the linchpin of everything about our, our belief in Jesus and who he is and what, what this is all about and redemption itself. So this is not some light issue, not some side deal. <clears throat> And basically, you've got, uh, you've got two opinions going on, and you'll see this all through the church world. You've got two opinions going on. Uh, one opinion, of course, is that Jesus became man, and he maintained his uh, omni-God qualities or abilities. And when he did miracles, he did them because he's God. When he walked on water, he did it because he was God. Uh, everything he did, he did it because he was God. His resurrection was because he was God. Everything flowed out of that, out of his godness, because he, uh, he never gave up the attributes, the, uh, the abilities that he had as God. He lived as man, but he had all these abilities, which puts him far above us in everything uh, and all temptations. The other side is what we're trying to convince you of, that he set aside all of those abilities. And while he's God, he never gave up being God, which is who he is. He gave up everything he had as God. And you can give up what you have without giving up who you are. And again, the illustration of that is your hand. Your hand is not you, uh, but it's an extension of you. And you can cut off your hand and you're still you. So you can, he gave up the attributes that he had the advantages he had over us as God, but he never gave up being God. So Jesus is totally God, totally man, but he's totally man without the, he's totally God without the attributes of God. And he's operating on the resource of a man. 
Now, this uh, demands, of course, what we've been talking about in terms of the Trinity. This demands a Trinity concept. And uh, Trinity, again, you know, is a, is, a, is a theological term. It's never in the Bible. You never see the word Trinity in the Bible. But it bespeaks the three-in-one concept, which is in the Scriptures. And again, in the Old Testament, everywhere you go uh, where the word God is used, it's plural. So God is presented to us in this pluralistic idea or plural idea. Uh, and yet the Bible says he's one. So you get this dual thing going on in the Old Testament that our God is one and yet he, he talks in terms of let us. Then you come to the New Testament and it's clarified in Father, Son, and Spirit. And we get the Trinity idea. So you've got these three distinct personalities uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who each have their own personalities and are distinct individual persons in themselves, and yet they have come together in such oneness that they think as one, they will as one, they are one. And again, nobody has ever understood that. Nobody can explain that. We use all kinds of illustrations for it, but it's beyond our comprehension at this point. And yet, if you come to us and say, you believe in three gods, we will immediately say, no, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God. <clears throat> but this one God has three personalities, and they have become one and function as a unit. So when I stand up, uh, when you hear me talking or praying or whatever, uh, and I say, God, in your mind, don't think about the Father. Think about the Trinity, because I'm most people, when you say God, immediately think about this person, and they don't think about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But when I talk about God, I'm, I've trained my mind to think in terms of the Trinity, the Trinity God. Yes, question. We got, whoa, microphone. Yes, over here. Thank you. Sure, uh statement and then maybe a little answer. Okay, good. I was raised in a in a Pentecostal. Yes. My family was Pentecostal. Okay. My mom's family. Sure. Uh, my father's family was Southern Baptist. In my Pentecostal family, we believe that God's the Father, Jesus is the Son, the Lord is the Holy Spirit, but all the three are one. Yeah. But like in the Baptist part of my dad's family, they were all separated. I guess God would be well, God and Jesus would be his son the way that they, you know, and then really don't know where the Holy Spirit uh, fell in with all that because I probably lean more towards the Pentecostal part of my bringing. But um, could you explain that to me a little bit? Well, I'm not. I'm, I, mean, I understand what you're saying. I, that's how I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, see, you re run into real problems if you think in terms of... Uh, this uh, Jesus as a produced individual. Yeah. In other words, a son, well, that means there's a time he wasn't. Yeah. Well, if there was a time he wasn't, then he isn't God because God is eternal. So Jesus then becomes a product of, uh, of God, like he's a son of, of this member, like, and that puts, that puts the father into some kind of uh, sexual involvement which is really makes me nervous, see, wherever you go with that, yeah. uh, that Jesus is a produced individual, which makes his death, nullifies his death right. as, as re being redemptive. So that, to me, that's really a dangerous thing. Uh, and, of course, there's, a, there's another group that, that is called the Jesus-only group that doesn't believe in the Trinity, but believes that Jesus is, is the God Okay. Uh, and that the father, uh, sometimes he played the father's role, sometimes he played the spirit role, but he really is Jesus, just Jesus, and it's the Jesus only thing. Okay. Uh, so there's that whole aspect. I've seen signs for churches called Jesus only tabernacles. And yeah, like that. yeah, that's that's that group. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of ideas out there. See, and and uh, you you've got to you've got to come to. And this, again, that's why I say this is a linchpin concept. What you believe about this is going to determine your whole view of Christianity.
And, and it's got to be a biblical view. See, how, how am I supposed to know right. whether the Jesus-only group, whether your Baptist friends were, were right or whether your Pentecostal, how am I supposed to know? See, I'm, and, and it becomes, well, I was raised in this, so I accept that. Instead of, I've got to come to the scriptures and say, I, I, I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. So that's what we're trying to do is, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I really appreciate that. It, well. You know, because it. it you know, I know. It, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of confusion. There's one very large group, by the way, that believes that Jesus is not God. Well, yeah, there's a large group. I would say there's quite a few of those. Yeah. Quite a few of those groups, because uh, I, hey, a guy in jail. I probably told you this. A guy in a jail the other day. Uh, I was talking about Jesus. He said, "I believe in Jesus, but he's a Muslim, but he doesn't believe in my Jesus. See, his Jesus isn't my Jesus." Um, back on the subject of, uh, of uh, Jesus being God and 100% God and 100% man, there's an example from literature. Um, that I think is so so close in its design that it helps to understand, it helps to grasp the concept. Okay. Um, there's a, um, uh, a novel, uh, classic novel named um, the, um, the, the, ooh, I had it in my head and I lost it. Um, and you're not talking about what you say that again. The oh, the prince and the pauper. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Do you know who the author was? I don't remember who the author was, but it's a famous classic literature. A prince, one day, and he's in the castle, of course, and one day he sees one of the maid sons that's come to work with his mother, and he's absolutely looks exactly like Prince. And so the two guys that get together, and the Prince said, I, you know, I've always wanted to get out in the world and see what things look like. And um, the pauper uh, said, uh, yeah, well, it, it's not so good. He said, well, I would like to go out and see for myself. Uh, so they decided they would change clothes and uh, switch clothes. And the pauper would stay as the prince, and the prince would, would go out and look around for a day. And they, you know, that night they would change back again. Well, as you might well guess, it didn't work uh, because they looked so much alike that the uh, the people in the palace, including the king, wouldn't let the prince leave, even though he kept saying, "I'm not the prince. I'm just a pauper." And he said, Come on now, stop that nonsense. And uh, of course, he had the same result on the other end. The prince did. This went on for months. So, was he the prince or was he the pauper? Right. Well, the answer is yeah. <laughs> he was. <laughs> Both, yeah. He, he held the position of prince. He was bloodline, he was the prince. But he was no more prince than you and I are. On the, yeah. the pauper because he, he lived in ragged, nasty clothes and in a nasty, nasty and apartment building and um, had no authority and had no authority. Uh, got no. It didn't have a decent meal for almost a year, if I remember right. Um, so he really was a hundred percent. But but he was still also technically. And really, the, the prince. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's such a, a, a close, and I yeah. don't know, maybe the author even did that on purpose to, to make that e an example, but I think that's such a perfect yeah. example in that it shows you that in real life that could happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so Jesus uh, was absolute God, but at the same time, he was absolute man, and same with the, with the prince. Yeah. You know, uh, there would be some, obviously, that is imagery. Mark Twain. Thank you. Uh, obviously, there, that's imagery, and there would be some breakdown in that, in the fact that Jesus uh, didn't 
uh, have the resource he had, because he set it aside, whereas the prince didn't have the resource because he wasn't recognized for who he was. Uh, so there would be some breakdown, but that's phenomenal imagery. Perfect. Yeah, not, but it, but it, but it helps us in in grasping and understanding the dynamic of what's going on here. And then we we injected this thought, I think, last week, which really is just amazing, amazing, amazing. And that is that this was not a temporary thing. This was an eternal thing, that he gave up his resource that he had as God set it aside, became man, and he never ceased to be man, which kicks it from a 33-year sacrifice to an eternal sacrifice. And when he comes back the second time, he'll come back as man. He's man now. He's always been man. Uh, he's never giving up. He, he never gave that up. In other words, he never went back to be the king. He's always stayed the pauper. And is always embraced and is embracing us. And so Bible scholars uh, have yelled for years that, oh, one of us, one of us with our skin on has made it to the right hand of God. One of us, which is Jesus, which is phenomenal. So this concept, again, is, uh, is really key. Now, last week we looked at John chapter 14 and maybe we, maybe we finished that. Um, maybe we saw enough of that that you, uh, but th this is one of the strong passages for uh, where this, uh, this truth is taught us. And it comes right out of the lips of Jesus himself, which again is phenomenal. And we were dealing, uh, just to, to capture it again, we were dealing with John chapter 14, uh, verse 9. Uh, Philip has said to Jesus, and of course, uh, again, put this in context, that they're in the upper room, and this is the last, uh, the last day before uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and they're going into the uh, Lord's Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane and the crucifixion. Uh, so this is really crucial time, uh, and Jesus is dead serious about everything he's saying. Uh, not that he wasn't before, but so in verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long, and yet you've not known me, Philip. He who has sent me, he who has seen me, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, that is a foundational statement that Jesus makes, saying, I don't do what I do, because I'm God and have God powers, although I am God, but that isn't the way I do what I do. I do what I do because I'm a man who's filled with the Father. And the Father is doing this through me. And he's, he's clarifying all that for the sake of launching us into all the rest of chapter 14, 15, and 16, which is all about the explanation for Pentecost, which is saying you're going to get this same relationship with God that I have, the same relationship I have with my Father, you are going to have as well. In fact, in verse 12, there's those amazing statements where he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Uh, so he was talking about, yes, sir, uh, microphone. Uh, the last uh, part of 10. Okay. Did I hear you say that the works? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. No, the last part of 10. 
the works. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Yes. That, see, that's the, that's not correct. That's not okay. The original. Okay. The original is a lot better. Does his works? <coughs> oh, his. And taking credit for the works at all. Hmm. It's not the works. It's that's his. interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So, uh, yeah, well, it depends on what translation you get a hold of, see. But you're saying that word is really, could literally be his. The word his is there. Yeah. How to, and it's, they just ignored that word. What does the rest of your translation say on that? Anybody got a different translation than the New King James? Oh, well, I've got NASB. Let's see what it says. Um, his works but the father who dwells in me does his works hmm. yeah that's beautiful yeah NASB says his work also yeah yes sir King James uh, oh uh, it's the works. Yeah, well, that which is what I have. Yeah. James, they just plain ignored. Yeah, the, the works. Opinion. That's that's just dead wrong. That's not yeah. a different opinion. I mean, yeah. Um, that's just plain wrong. I'll have you bring that up to D.W. How is it wrong? Well, uh, in the original language, which is the Greek language that this is translated from, the word "his" is there, not the word "the." So they they left that out. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, it is. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. Uh, so the rest of this, that, and this becomes the language uh, that he is going to use uh, for us in a, uh, 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 for instance, go to verse 20 in that same chapter. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. See, he, 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 br he brings this into this kind of union that what's going on in his life in terms of the resource of the Father working through him and oneness and intimacy and merger with the Father is going to happen in us. Uh, so that becomes, uh, that becomes the language he begins to use through this entire, thank you, sir, uh, becomes the language he uses through this entire then he's going to go into the vine and the branch thing, which becomes the parable, uh, which gives you uh, that kind of emphasis as well in imagery of this kind of oneness. Uh, so that was the passage that we dealt with last week. Uh, I want to deal with some other passages, if you would. Uh, I'd like for you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> now, Chapter 14 and 15 and 16 of John, of course, were presenting to us the idea of Jesus was giving explanation to what was going to happen in terms of when, he is, when he's died, rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and then poured his spirit out upon us, what was going to happen and where all of this was going to head. Uh, now, in Acts chapter 2, you have the scene where it actually happens. And this event, which we call Pentecost, which is the outpouring of the Spirit, which is the event where God, through His Spirit, the nature of God, actually indwells the human being, is given to us. This event is described for us in verse 1 down through verse 4. And uh, we don't have time to go through all of that. But uh, as you, after, after this event took place, there was such a phenomenal happening uh, among the 120, and I believe that uh, Pentecost didn't happen in an upper room. I, I believe it happened down in the uh, temple. They spent a lot of their time in the temple. They spent most of their time in the temple. They were not hiding in an upper room, uh, so don't get that imagery. For years, I had the imagery that 120 people were hiding in this upper room, doors locked, uh, 50 days they stayed up there in that upper room. 50 days without showers. Whoa. Finally, God hit the place and the door burst open. They said, let's get out of here. <laughs> so, but that isn't, that it. They, they, uh, Luke, at the end of his gospel, says that they spent most of their time in the temple praising God. And the word, the Greek word for, uh, for house, 
uh, which is used in chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 1, uh, can also be translated dwelling place, which is what they considered uh, the temple. So there's some, uh, some ability there as well, some insight there as well. So anyhow, you got this event taking place. They were in the temple. And if you'll note in verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, you, you need to understand from a historical perspective, there was, uh, there was, this, there was this feeling all over the world, not just Jews, uh, but all over the world. There was, the, at that time, the historians recorded, there was this feeling that something big was about to happen. Uh, you remember how it was at the turn of uh, the, the, uh, the year 2000, uh, the coming in of the new century. Uh, Y2K, planes are going to fall out of the sky, computers are all going to go down, I'm going to lose all my money. Uh, everybody in the whole world was, I mean, there was this anticipation that something big was going to happen. And then nothing happened. We were all disappointed. Anyhow, that kind of feeling was present here, they say. And of course, if you were a Jew, you would think, well, if something big is about to happen, who's going, where, where's it going to come from? God, obviously, Jehovah God. So they got the idea. Uh, obviously, God was going to pull it off. And where would he pull it off at? Jerusalem. So these people who are from the exile, they're from all of these nations all over the world, have gathered together in chapter uh, 2, verse 5. They are from every nation under heaven. So these are Jews that are a result of the exiles who have now come to Jerusalem uh, year after year. They bought condominiums down by the temple. Uh, they're the original snowbirds, and they, are, they come spatially during the feast days. So here they are. And when Pentecost happened, it blew them away. In fact, if you go down to verse 12, you'll note that they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? What does this mean? What's this mean to be? How does this apply to my life? What's going on? And Peter, in verse 14, stood up and said, I'm going to raise this voice and said to them, uh, I'll explain it to you. So Peter is going to give an explanation of what's going on in 120 people who have just received the fullness of the Spirit. And he selects his text, which is Joel, according to verse 16. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes it all the way down to verse 21 of Acts chapter 2. And then he begins his message. Yes. I just have a question. Okay. Uh, we need the microphone. Oh, there you go. Back to, and I, I hate to keep going back to this, but. That's fine. 39 years old, and I want a little bit of clarity on what I've been taught about. <clears throat> okay. We're talking about the, the day of the Pentecost, right? Right. Um, I know one scripture that was repeated over and over in the Pentecostal church that I was raised in. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I know that a few times since I've been in this program and coming here, we've kind of touched back and forth on the whole baptism thing. Um, and maybe we're going to get there, but I'm just trying to follow where you're going. And, and okay. I mean, I, I don't understand... I know when I was growing up, I was baptized three times. I didn't really know what was going on other than I wanted to be like everybody else in the church, you know, and play in the water to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, I was taught to believe that everybody in the church talked in tongues. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of things that I can, Sure. And maybe one day I'll be able to talk to you. But so is this like what I was taught to believe, like on the day of Pentecost, is it Peter... <sighs> Like the whole baptism thing. I mean, I don't explain that to me why it's so important for the Pentecostals, or I don't even know where I'm going with this. It's just confusing me. But um, I don't believe at this point in my life that everybody has to be baptized to be saved. Am I wrong for that? No. I feel like I've been saved as an adult. 
in the church, we have what is called sacraments. And sacraments, by definition, are things that Jesus commanded us that came from his lips and he commanded us to be a part of and to do as, gr as a group, as a, as a body of Christ. One of them is communion. I mean, he's in an upper room and he says, do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> so communion is to be a part of the activity of the body of Christ. That's a sacrament. Baptism is another. In the Matthew 28, uh, he said, go and make disciples and baptize them. So the baptism was, became a sacrament. Now, there are some who say the feet washing thing is a sacrament. Yeah. Uh, but you have to press that one a little. You have to kind of read into it. Uh, so most of the evangelical church hasn't adopted that as a sacrament coming from the lips of Jesus. That he was telling us, he did it by example, but he didn't really say to us, this is, a, this is an activity I want you in the body of Christ to participate in, as he did in the communion and as he did in the baptism. So we have two sacraments. This is more of a humility. Yes, and it's not bad. No. And nobody condemns it. I mean, it's okay, obviously. But uh, in, com in, in the sacrament, uh, which is baptism and communion, uh, they are outward, visible signs, activities that are declaring something of the spiritual realities that are going on within us. Now, again, you get all kinds of belief systems going on, but uh, you, you cannot, uh, for instance, let's go back to baptism. You cannot equate baptism with salvation. You just can't do it. The first time I ever really just veered away from religion, church, and everything, I was around 16 years old, and I had a cousin that was dying of muscular dystrophy, and he wanted to be baptized because that's how he was raised to believe sure. before he died. And our pastor or our preacher wouldn't baptize him because he had long hair. Mm -hmm. He died without being baptized, feeling like he wasn't saved. Mm. So that was the first time I really felt let down. And I, I'm not going to lie, Pastor uh, Manley, I was let down. I felt like I was let down by God. I mean, this is, you know... A preacher, you know, here to teach us the word and God's purpose and all that. And he won't even baptize the dying man, you know. So yeah. i got to undo all of that. Stuff. Yeah, sure. And, and that's difficult. But can you imagine going to heaven and, and meeting Jesus and he says, you can't be here, manly. And I say, but I've loved you. I loved you. Uh, I gave my life to you. I've had intimate fellowship with you. I was filled with your spirit. Uh, I, uh, you, uh, I was a part of, of what you were doing in my world. Yeah, but Manly, you weren't put underwater. See, that, that doesn't equate. And we, of course, you got the supreme example of the thief on the cross. I mean, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. You got that supreme example of a guy who's in paradise with Jesus and he was never baptized. So, and Jesus was constantly, if Jesus did anything, had any rub with the Pharisees, it was over their legalistic, legalistic uh, physical practices that didn't have spiritual realities within them. I mean, he was dead set on that. He just couldn't stand that. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about that Sunday morning because it, it was hypocritical. See, you do this outside, but inside you're not. And he, he looked at him and said, on the outside, you wash the cup, but on the inside, you, it's putrid. You whitewash sepulchers, he called them, which is an external demonstration without an internal reality. Yes, sir. Um, hearing you say that, you know, he's such against it. Um, did he like you know, like, expose it because they were leadership and, you know, they were responsible of leading others astray? That would have been part of it, sure. That's good insight. Yeah, definitely. 
But just the idea, uh, in fact, Sunday morning, I'm going to talk about uh, hypocrisy. Uh, 14 times, shouldn't be telling you this, should save it, but 14 times in the Gospels, the word hypocrites is used. 14 times. And every time Jesus is saying the word. I mean, he was after that thing. Uh, so, when you come to Peter, Peter, of course, is emphasizing his culture as well. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with what he has to say. Uh, and that is in verse 38. But the emphasis is a, a, a complete uh, repentance and turn to repent and be baptized. In fact, the John, what he would have been used to, Peter would have been used to, would have been John the Baptist, uh, his, his methodology, which was you came up front and you repented, confessed all your sins. Then you were baptized. <laughs> That'd be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> Publicly. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because this is a complete turnaround and 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 change in the inner life. So back to uh, Peter's sermon, which that was a part of, but that was the ending. If you go to the beginning, I want you to see this. This is this is mind-boggling to me. Uh, he's just given his text, and then he gives again what we call the proposition of the sermon which is the whole sermon reduced down to one sentence. <coughs> so that verse 22, 23, and 24 make up one sentence, which is the consistency or context, or no, not context, which is the content of the entire sermon. So any place you go in the sermon, you're going to come back to what he says in these three verses. 23, 22, 23, and 24. Now listen to this. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Now remember, before I do this, he's, he's explaining Pentecost. The fullness of the Spirit has just come upon them. 120 have received it. He says, I'm going to explain it to you. Here's the explanation. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, proven by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be healed by it. Now, let's back up and analyze that. He's explaining Pentecost. And how does he explain Pentecost? The explanation for Pentecost is... Jesus of Nazareth, a man. That's the explanation. Now, note, he says, <coughs> he says, Jesus of Nazareth. And in other words, it isn't any old Jesus. It's a specific Jesus. Which, in their day, there were a lot of people named Jesus. So, and Jesus is another uh, word for uh, what, jo uh, Joshua. So, uh, Jesus, we're talking about the specific Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And then he goes on to say, the one you crucified, which really specifies it. So, this Jesus is the explanation of Pentecost, and he was a man. So, the emphasis in explaining Pentecost is not on Jesus who was God, although he was. The emphasis is on Jesus who was a man. So, if you want to know what a person looks like when they're full of God, filled with God, they look like him. Because he is the prototype the first one to have this. So whatever's going on, whatever the Spirit of God is doing in him, that same Spirit has now come to 120 and is doing it in them. And it's promised to you. So Jesus becomes the first individual to be filled with the Spirit. So Pentecost really happened or really started happening with Jesus. He was the first one to have the Pentecostal experience. 
So whatever happened in him, now you run into all kinds of things with that. If it's going on in Jesus, I want it. If it isn't going on in Jesus, I don't want it. If Jesus did it, I'm going to do it. If Jesus didn't do it, I'm not interested. He becomes the standard for this. Did Jesus get filled with the Spirit and bark like a dog? Wow. No, he did not. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> See, he's the standard. In other words, I'm not going to get anything that Jesus didn't have, so I'm not going to go beyond him, and I'm not, I, I can't live less than him because he, the resource he had, I have. So he becomes the standard. So see, all of a sudden, Christ's likeness becomes significant. Yes, sir. Um, some of my friends say this at different times, and uh, this reminds me of it, I guess. Uh, you know, so this is where Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, you know, there isn't too many people that say, well, you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Um, but isn't that, I guess, how it's supposed to be? Yes. As he was the visible image of the invisible father, so we are the visible image of the Jesus, the invisible Jesus. We're to be the display. We're the physical display. Uh, and, and we talk about this all the time, but the interplay between the spiritual and the physical, the interplay, you, you, n there's nothing going on in the spiritual that isn't going to display itself in the physical. That's, see, you can't, you can't be mad inside. You can't hate and be mad inside without it affecting you physically. Somehow, some way, it's going to show up. Ulcers, somehow. Attitudes are going to be expressed. You, 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 can't, you can't help it. So if you are full of Jesus, in fact, as you, as you get into the creation story, you begin to discover that the reason you were created is so you could be the expression of him. That God created a world that couldn't see him and now they can see him because you are filled with him and you become the platform upon which he acts to display who he is. Which is phenomenal. And that's what Pentecost is or fullness of the spirit or that's who Jesus is. A man filled with the spirit. Now, is he God? Yes. See, we're, we're keeping on track, are we? We're not demeaning the fact that he's God. We're simply saying that he is God who set aside every advantage he had over you as God and became filled with the Spirit. And when Peter stands up to explain Pentecost, he explains him in terms of Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Yes, a microphone. Um. Another <clears throat> word is speaking in does speaking in tongues come into play in all this? Because I know that that's a big standard that you have to have. You have to experience all that to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, that is uh, that is a debatable theological uh, idea, and uh, frankly, again, I'm trying to. I'm trying to come at it. See, never in the scriptures does it equate being filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues. And, and if you want to say, well, they all did it at Pentecost. What they did at Pentecost was not an unknown language. They spoke in 15 different dialects that the group of, of the exile, Jew, exile Jews who came understood. And he lists the dialects. Okay. So, if you're saying that uh, if it, it, that the, the gift of tongues is, is speaking in a known language, for instance, I would speak in Spanish to a Spanish group and not know Spanish, that would be the gift of tongues. You were just always told that when you talked in tongues, only God in the pasture. Yeah, yeah, which, which is the whole First Corinthian thing, which is, um, see, that's shaky. So... Uh, 
I, and, and I don't want to be too strong on that because I have lots of friends who speak in tongues. And hey, if it helps you, God bless you, help yourself. But don't come and make that a standard. And Jesus, where is it recorded that Jesus spoke in tongues? See, you can't find it. So if it isn't in him, if he's the prototype, if he sets the standard, then, then you're, you're hard pressed on that one. Thank you. So that's, that's a question mark. So we're back to this. Here is a passage that says 120 have been filled with the Spirit and the explanation for what's going on in their lives is Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Whatever was going on in Jesus is now going on in them. Now look what he does with this in verse 12. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man proven by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. So Jesus went around doing wonders, miracles, and signs, proving the power of the God who came to dwell within him. So the miracles in Jesus were a sign that displayed the fact that he was filled with the Spirit. Then he goes on to say, and it's, it's so specific, look at this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man proven by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him. Which is so specific, it's hard to say, well, Jesus did it. No, it was done through him by God the Father through the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity God acted through the man called Jesus. So Jesus didn't do what he did because he's God. He did what he did because he was a man filled with God, which was Peter's explanation of Pentecost. I don't know what to do with that. In fact, we'll go on. That, so God proved Pentecost or the fullness of the Spirit. He proved this merger that we've been talking about, this God coming to live within the human life. He proved this through the man called Jesus by his life. So here's the life of Jesus, miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him. Then he goes on to say in verse uh, 23, Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. <clears throat> so God proved the fullness of the Spirit in Jesus by his life and by his death. Now, there's a great study here. You, you need to get into this, and that's probably not for tonight. But he says, Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, the Jews killed him. No, they didn't. Well, yes, they did. No, it was the Romans. They, no, well, was it the Romans, the Jews? No, they got together and they killed. Well, he says, God is responsible for this cross. Listen to it again. He was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. That God determined the crucifixion. And then he goes on to say, you have taken by law its hands of crucified and put to death. So you get this, this, all the way through the scriptures, you get this dualistic idea of God is responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus and he used the lawless hands of men to get it done. So, God proved Pentecost, the fullness of the Spirit, through the man called Jesus, not because he, did, not because he had divine powers, uh, 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 not because he had his attributes, but because he set them aside, became a total man, was filled with the Spirit, and God proved this fullness of the Spirit works through his life and through his death. Wouldn't it be something? This is just bug me. Wouldn't it be something if not just my life, God significantly used my life for his glory to manifest himself, but he could use my death 
See, I don't want to just, just die. I want my death to mean, and I know I won't redeem a world. I, got, I, get, I get that. But wouldn't it be something if my death could, could have be in the plan and purpose of God to significantly impact my world? So not only my life, but my death. That's the way Jesus was. And then he goes on to say, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Pains of death is travail, the idea of travail, which is birth pain stuff. And um, which I know nothing about. God raised up having loosed the pains of death. And he pictures, he pictures uh, the devil and all the evil forces with, as having gigantic fingers reaching out to grab a hold of Jesus and hold him and pull him down and trap him. And, oh, and they just can't hold him. No more than a woman can keep a baby in her womb forever so that they couldn't hold Jesus. Why? Because, not because he was God, although he is God, but because he's a man filled with the Spirit of God and death couldn't hold him. So that not only did his uh, life prove Pentecost, did his death prove Pentecost, but his resurrection proved Pentecost. So God used, the Father, Trinity God, used the entirety of the life of the man called Jesus to prove this thing right here. What he was after was he wants to come and indwell your life. He wants to infiltrate your entire system, share your mind, share your emotions, share your nervous structure, share your body, display who he is in your life, in your death, and in your resurrection. So Jesus is, an, is a man, he's God, we understand, but he's God who set aside every divine ability he had and he had no edge on you. He had nothing going on in his life that you can't have going on in your life. There was no resource. So when Peter comes to explain to this crowd what's going on in the 120, this is his explanation. Now the whole sermon, the whole rest of the sermon is going to underline this he's just gonna he's just gonna expand on it but that's his basic proposition oh, it's phenomenal isn't it? what do you think it's good I'm speechless just leave one. I don't even know if we're laughing until I really, I mean, I believe in them. You know what I mean? How could I not? Yeah, well, sure. Religion part of it all. I don't know. Okay. Yes, Scott. You got the microphone? Okay, just kind of. Yes, you do. Um, God the Father sees no sin, cannot see no sin at all, correct? Okay. And say the Jews technically are not really responsible for the death of Jesus. He's saying the Father was responsible for the death of the Son. But it doesn't, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, sorry. But don't, we dare not indicate that it relieved them of the responsibility. Of the sin of? Of the sin of crucifying Jesus. Uh, you get the same thing with Judas. See that uh, Judas, well, somebody had to do it, and poor Judas got chosen. Well, no, G Judas is responsible. God is, God the Trinity God is responsible, but Judas is responsible as well. And you cannot distinguish, you cannot alleviate the responsibility from the man called Judas. He is held accountable for that. That's kind of where I was going to go with that, toward the end of that, with that question, because Judas was... The one that turned Jesus in, the Jews yeah. crucified him. 
but a guy the father can't see sin and will not see sin and have turned his back on the son. So just kind of the way it's worded, I just didn't quite uh, quite get it there at first. Uh, you've got the whole Judas thing in chapter 1 of, uh, of uh, uh, Acts uh, down in verse uh, 16 where they're talking about him. Uh, he became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Uh, so, it, yes, sir. For me, it, it was a really slippery slope to stay so focused on what I knew before and what I've been taught before. Um, because I, I mean, I've been all over the spectrum as well. But something that I've had to let go of is the the deeds. Um, okay. We can try to... I'm trying to I'm trying to go back to my thought process of how hard it was to break the cycle because I would I would try to get put in Pentecostal uh, school I was uh, brought into a lot of that stuff and you know our tongue real I can't say yes or no but what I can say <coughs> is that the same spirit inside of me is just as powerful as the spirit inside a person who may speak tongues everybody yes. has their own gift everybody has their own yes. Gift. God has put on each one of Got to be, brother. You can't, you can't get held up on what I was taught in the past and what I'm taught now. You just have to, you just have to learn what you can right now and put in the application that's practical within your understanding. Can you say that first part again? The first part you said again. That was four whole words ago. Yeah, okay. that was so eloquent. Yeah, I can't hear that. I'm like, I can't get it out either. <laughs> He is, he is eloquent. Oh, he's eloquent, isn't he? He is eloquent. <laughs> but I, just, I, I want to, I'm, I'm very sincere on that one. I do say that it is important not to stay stuck on the stuff that you was taught. It's so important to listen, to listen and try to get a practical understanding. Because for me, I have to, I have to know the baseline is what I was taught before. But coming from my background with all the spirit and with uh, religion and, and the religious side where, um, you know, my family does this on Sunday and then on Monday they're over here doing this, totally separate from what they was doing. Now, I'm not I'm not after the religion. I'm after the spirituality. I'm after the actual. Yes, good. Good. You know, I, I'm with you. I hope that helps. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you. Here you go, Wayne. On the subject of uh, God's responsibility for the cross, um, I think Joseph explains it pretty well in the Old Testament when his brother sold him into mm. slavery. Yep. From that, he ultimately became the second <clears throat> in the entire country of Egypt. And he said to his brothers, you meant it to me for evil. evil. But God, God meant it for good. For good. Yep. The same event. Yep. 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 Uh, and this isn't just one place, you understand, where you uh, run into that. Uh, for instance, if you're interested uh, in uh, Matthew, or Acts chapter 4, uh, persecution has, stop, uh, has started and they are turned loose to come back to the early church. And when they get back to the early church, they break into a prayer meeting. And in verse 27, they say this, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So what's he saying? He's saying, Herod, Pontius Pilate, all the Jews, all the Gentiles, you gather, you herded them together like a bunch of cows. And when you got them all herded together, you said, do what you want to do. And what did they do? Exactly what you wanted them to do. <laughs> so your will was accomplished in the crucifixion of Jesus. It's an amazing picture. Amazing picture. It's the, it's the wise man. Oh, it's the wise I thought maybe the wise man was going to say something. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, uh, have we have we have we discussed that enough? Have you got have you got this picture in Acts two? Uh, anything else we need to add uh, to that? <clears throat> now that's consistently going to be the flow all the way through the rest of the book of Acts. They're all going to be focused on Jesus. And, it, and, and it's really interesting to me uh, in, in this whole pattern as this flows through the book of Acts that the emphasis uh, is always on this Jesus. It's never on this. All their sermons are about Jesus. They, they hardly ever talk about him. Which is what Jesus said would happen. Jesus said, when you're full of him, you're going to glorify me. So the test of whether you're full of the Spirit is not how much you talk about Holy Spirit, how much you talk about Jesus. Because the Spirit is constantly glorifying Jesus. Which is really an interesting... It's also interesting in, in this life thing, uh, if it don't... Uh, he... he uh, uh, demonstrated uh, <clears throat> God, God the Trinity God proved Pentecost through Jesus by miracles, wonders, and signs but the miracles were not just healings and that sort of thing. That did go on and he did hundreds of them. There's no question about that. But that wasn't, that wasn't the miracle. The miracle was he was fulfilling the purpose and direction of the Father in his life. So don't come along and say, well, if I'm full of the Spirit, I'll do miracles. Well, not miracles maybe in healing, but miracles in fulfilling the direction and purpose that God has for your life. Which if that includes, and it's really interesting in the book of Acts, nobody is recorded in the book of Acts of doing any miracles at all outside of the 12 apostles and two deacons. So don't gauge, well, I couldn't be filled with the Spirit because I'm not healing anybody. See, don't gauge, that's not the gauge. This is not the gauge. The demonstration of the person of Jesus is the gauge. And the danger of spiritual gifts, the danger of the spiritual gifts, like healing, tongues, and whatever, the danger of the spiritual gifts is it sets up a platform for spiritual egos, for us to develop spiritual pride, which is what Jesus is hitting, what we're talking about on Sunday morning, where I'm fasting, therefore I disfigure my face. Why? Because it's a spiritual pride thing. Look at me thing, which is the opposite of this. Yes, sir. Wouldn't the miracle in, in the life with the life of Jesus inside of you, wouldn't the miracle in itself become selflessness? Is that not a miracle? Oh, it is. Whew. Nature? It is, brother. And that's a miracle for me to... That is an impossible, impossibility to pull off. Because, as we've said often, it, there, it's a built-in trap. The minute you say... I'm going to no longer be self-centered. You have focused on yourself and you're self-centered. <laughs> See, it's a built-in trap. So this has to come from outside you. The deliverance of self-centeredness has to happen outside of you, which is this. He has to come and give you his nature. Yes, sir. That's like the definition of humility. Humility is not that I think well of myself. Humility is not that I think badly of myself. Humility is not thinking about myself. <laughs> At all. Yep. At all. At all. At all. Well, I hope that's helpful. Uh, we've still got 20 minutes left, but I hate to get into, uh, I was going to, I wanted to get into some of these other passages. Uh, and maybe we're dragging this out a little far, but I wanted you to get... Yes, sir? I have a question that doesn't have anything to do with this. Okay. 
Um, Lay it on me, brother. Because you listed life, death, and resurrection, I'm curious, the man of Jesus, when he died, that those two or three days when he was dead, um, there's one verse that says he descended. What do you think that looked like? For the, do you think he went down, or do you think he was just in the tomb? I'm just curious for your point of view. Well, it's, it's a really a difficult, uh, because there isn't much scripture on it. That's the difficulty. It's hard to prove anything by scriptures. Uh, but uh, he, he definitely descended and spoke to the captives. Uh, that's First Peter. So, in, uh, and, and, and my take on it, and, and it, if you say, well, I don't agree with that, it's fine. No, no big deal. Uh, but uh, the Bible talks constantly, and the Old, the Old Testament approach was the Sheol thing, which was made up of two compartments. You've got this Sheol, which is made up of uh, paradise, which is not heaven, it's paradise, and Hades, which is not hell. And according to the Old Testament, it was a foggy uh, sleep kind of thing. Um, Where do you find this in the Bible? Well, uh, there's a variety of Old Testament scriptures that talk about Sheol. Uh, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't spell them out for you, but <laughs> This is found as an Old Testament concept. Of course, Jesus talked again to the thief on the cross, said, today we will be with me in paradise. He was referring to here. Uh, and again, it's a foggy, sleepy thing. Um, it's, uh, for instance, the Saul, the king, uh, wanted to call Samuel. Samuel had died, and Saul was up against it and wanted some insight. So he, want, he went to the witch of Endor and called Samuel back from paradise. Hmm. Samuel came back wiping his eyes saying, why did you wake me up? Which was the sleeping thing. So you got that whole, this is an Old Testament concept. So Jesus again said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So obviously when Jesus died, he went into this. Hmm. And he preached to these people. In other words, gave them revelation and broke this thing up. Now, in the Old Testament, you could call people back from the dead, obviously. There was an interaction. But now this has been canceled. This exists no longer. And through his death, he established heaven and hell. And the judgment day was this time. This was the judging time right there. I mean, John is really strong on that, <laughs> that the judgment of God on sin took place right here. So when I die, I go here or here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Paul said. So we don't go into a sleeping, intermedial, uh, purgatory, that concept. It's final. As far as I can figure out, that's the biblical view from the Old Testament moving into the New Testament. And there's a lot of questions here that I can't answer. Okay. Yes. Did he, did you answer him? He said, if you could clarify, did you say did God go down? Yeah. He, yeah. He answered, yeah. Yeah. Jesus, when he died, went, in, went into this. Where did he go? He went into paradise in Hades, which was Sheol. Okay. Where all of the souls were up to, up to up to the time of Jesus' death. And then he led them out of there. That that all went away. How many days ago he rose? Three or four? Three and then he they, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he literally uh, did the equivalent of your eternity in hell. And again, how you calculate that, you have to see you can't in other words, you can't take every person who's ever lived and say, okay, there's this many people times the average lifespan uh, or the, the, the uh, lifespan of heaven, eternity, which you can't figure out anyway, and multiply it all together and say Jesus spent that amount of time in hell. But Jesus paid the entire penalty of your sin in this activity. 
He conquered hell and death. So you don't have to go here. This is never intended for you. God never sends you there. You may go there, but that's not intended for you. This is God's plan for you. Always has been. Oh, yes, sir. Doesn't it say that hell is prepared for the devil? Yes, it does. So hell didn't exist until that point or did it before that? No. No one went there yet. Yeah, that's my opinion. See, it's hard. It's hard to. It doesn't say that in any particular place in the scriptures. But when this broke up, uh, this was established. Yes, sir. So, so yeah, Jesus talked a lot about hell, right? He did. And up to that point, he's talking to a, Jew, a, a Jewish audience about a future place. So they're probably like. Because all they knew was about shape. And he, vi he visualized it for them because outside of Jerusalem, there was a place called Gehenna, the valley, where Mo uh, Moak had offered children, uh, had, 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 was, was a god, and they'd offered children as, as uh, sacrifices, burnt sacrifices to that god. And that valley was so stained with disobedience to God that it became a garbage dump. So they were always burning things. It was, it was a constant fire. And when they crucified so many people, Rome came in and crucified so many people, the crosses were butted together down the streets of Jerusalem. And when they took all the dead bodies, they threw them in. And the stench of burning flesh just was everywhere. And Jesus pointed to that and said, hell. Oh, so they threw bodies on that fire? Yeah. Wow. Now, the danger of all of that is that we begin to visualize hell as a physical fire. Ooh, that hurts my flesh. And we take a spiritual reality and make it a physical thing. And I'm, there's a danger in that. We do the same thing in heaven. Oh, heaven's going to be great. Why? Streets of gold. Who, who's going to care? Big mansion. See, I was poor down here. I'm going to be rich up there. See, and, and, and all religions have done that. See, the Muslims, hey, if I strap some bombs to myself and, and dynamite to myself and blow myself up, I'll have 10 virgins in heaven. <laughs> well, how's that any different than you saying I'm going to have a big mansion? They say you save one. So it, it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to just... And I'm not against streets of gold. And hey, if, there's, if they're there, that's fine. But that isn't going to be the wonder of heaven. Heaven is beyond the physical stuff. It's the spiritual realities that we're after here. Okay. Oh, yes. On the subject of heaven and hell, so do you say that you think hell is going to be... I mean, it not necessarily physical pain and fire, but like just the worst of the worst of the of living. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I do know what you mean. What would think think about this? Whatever I am here, I'm going along. I'm going along. And I cross this line into eternity. Whatever I am here, I'm going to be here. Yeah. For instance, let's say, uh, let's say I'm greedy. I spent my whole life being greedy. I'm just, <clears throat> I just want for me, I'm so greedy and I'm grabbing it. That isn't going to go away here. And here it's going to be expanded Nothing's ever going to be enough. And yet never satisfied. So I'm never, I'm going to be eaten alive with this. Ugh. Right. Do you think it works for common sense? Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Here I am. I'm wise here. Think of what, woo. <laughs> so enjoy the peace that you find in your life and salvation. It, it's expanded. It's going to be. Expanded. See, I'm seeking Jesus here. Hey, I'm not perfect. I get that. But 
Wow. See, think, don't think that dying is going to suddenly change things. I was a liar before, but I won't be a liar afterwards. Not true. Not true. This might sound a little juvenile, but I want your opinion on it. Do you think if we, when we die and go to heaven, family that's passed before us, you think we will know each other? I do. Yeah. I do. And, you know. In a, in a, in a larger, in a larger way. In a, <coughs> it's, it's, it's going to be fantastic. You don't want to miss it. Amen. Yeah, you don't want to miss it. Well, let's have prayer. Mike. I'm not you the other the I did. Well, I think he's scared to talk to you. I don't know why. Well, I'm a little scared to talk to him, smart as he is. <laughs> <laughs> let's have prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you prepared for us. Thank you for you are preparing us to be a place in which you can dwell, that you might expand your life through us forever and ever and ever. And we rejoice in that. Thank you for the sacrifice you made. Unbelievable. Uh, and thanks is so puny. Uh, we give our lives to you in gratitude. Uh, bless us through these next days. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.